workforce data quality campaign. And I'd like to take just a moment before we uh, move on to today's presentation to talk to you about the campaign. Um, so our mission uh, is to advocate for an inclusive, aligned, and market-relevant education and workforce data system that can help our nation's human capital policies to meet the challenges of a changing economy. Uh, we work at both the federal and state levels, promoting reforms for data systems that provide useful information for policymakers, students and workers, business leaders, and educators. Uh, at the state level, we uh, promote a state blueprint that identifies 13 key features of a high-quality data infrastructure. One of our uh, data blueprint one of our state blueprint items is capturing a broad range of credentials, which is, of course, our uh, conversation topic for today. At the federal level, we address federal, le federal legislation, funding, and technical assistance. Uh, our policy agenda was developed by a broad coalition of national organizations, state leaders, and technical experts across the education and workforce spectrum. Uh, our partners have been instrumental in developing that policy agenda, so wanted to acknowledge them quickly. Uh, the National Skills Coalition, the Association for Career and Technical Education, Institute for Higher Education Policy, National Association of State Workforce Agencies, CLASP, New America Foundation, Data Quality Campaign, National Association of State Directors of Career and Technical Education Consortium, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And we also want to thank our funders who support our work, the Apollo Group, Joyce Foundation, and Lumina Foundation. So Michelle, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the topic we're going to be exploring today? Thank you, Rachel. I will. Hello, this is Michelle Massey. I'm a policy analyst with the Workforce Data Quality Campaign. And I want to set the foundation for today's presentation. In today's education and workforce landscape, the proliferation of different types of credentials is causing confusion among stakeholders. The quality and value of many of these credentials is unclear. The case studies in the Credential Data Pioneers, forging new partnerships to measure certifications and licenses paper, and featured on today's webinar, do not cover data on certificates. The definition of certificate is provided to distinguish them from cert certifications and licenses. The webinar will focus on licenses and certifications, which can be hard to track because they are not awarded by schools. Licenses are usually given by state agencies, while certifications are given by entities like industry associations and employers. The definitions are based on the U.S. Census Bureau publications. The full definitions and citations for the census paper can be found in the creden Credential Data Pioneers report. They're also here on the slide, but again, you can find the full information in the report. Data systems should include a variety of credentials for making data better for several audiences. Workforce data quality campaign supports efforts to measure the full range of credentials, not just those associated with traditional education pathways. Data systems that capture all types of credentials can be used to show policymakers a fuller picture of the skilled workforce, so that they can see the results of their investments in education and training programs and identify skills gaps where further investment may be needed. Help educators know whether their occupational programs are appropriately pre preparing students to obtain credentials needed to advance in particular industries. Publicize the average earnings and employment trajectories of credential holders to assist students and workers in making education, career, and credentialing choices. And finally, to attract businesses seeking to expand or locate in areas with a supply of workers that have particular credentials. These data linkage linkages would enable richer and more complete analysis of education and training program alignment with industry requirements, as well as providing evidence on which licenses and certifications demonstrate value in the labor market over time. The report, Credential Data Pioneers, and this webinar highlight states and schools that have taken steps to broker data sharing agreements with certification bodies and licensing agencies in order to better understand the attainment and value of selected non-degree credentials. Here's a link to the full report and a 
snapshot of the photo for those of you who haven't seen it or read it. We encourage you to do so. Next slide. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. First, we will have Carol Rogers, who is the Deputy Director of the Indiana Business Research Center, followed by Catherine Imperator, who is the Research Manager for the Association for Career and Technical Education, and finally, Matthew Meyer, who is the Associate Vice President of STEM Innovations for the North Carolina Community College System. At this time, I would like to hand over the presentation to Carol. Thank you very much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And everyone at the Workforce Data Quality Campaign, we particularly appreciate being asked to uh, present to you all today out there uh, across the country. And I think it's very exciting that so many of us are interested in how we can leverage uh, administrative record data uh, to help us better understand uh, the integration uh, of workforce and education in today's market. So I'm going to be talking about licensing linkages, what we experienced here in Indiana. Next. Uh, we are fortunate in many ways, not always, but in many ways, to have a uh, an agency that is a single body that encompasses all of the information for certification, permits uh, for employment, and licensing in our state. And this was something that was enacted by our state legislature a number of years ago. And you can see by the, the list there for coverage uh, that in this consolidated uh, situation, uh, we can cover plumbers, uh, hypnotists, home inspectors, a wide spectrum of people who hold licenses or certification. Next. The content uh, is, is pretty much what you might expect uh, from such a, a conglomeration. I, I believe the public licensing agency uh, in effect, manages 35 different boards and commissions. Now, I should tell you, uh, before I get into the content, that probably one of the biggest things that's missing from this uh, combined database of licensure is teachers. But we are working with our State Department of Education uh, to get teacher licensing into uh, our integrated database. So just wanted to mention that in case you'd noticed it. Uh, the content includes names, uh, date of birth, uh, whether they're male or female, uh, the usual last four digits of the SOCH, uh, place of birth, but as you can see, it's very limited. Uh, there are licenses that are given to organizations and while that's interesting uh, and can certainly be integrated with our employer data from our EQUI information, uh, that's really not our primary focus with this data set. Importantly, the issue date of the license or certificate is included as well as when it expires. But probably more important for us is whether or not that license is active. Uh, that's really the group that we've been focusing on the most are those professionals or people with certifications uh, being active in their particular field. Uh, because there are certain agreements with our uh, bordering states uh, in terms of reciprocity, and it varies based on the kind of license, uh, what kind of reciprocity there is, we're going to have people who may actually work and live out of state, but they are licensed uh, because they may do some work on an intermittent basis or just travel from Louisville to New Albany, Indiana, across the river uh, to uh, work in a medical practice one day a week. So there are a lot of different situations that you can spot with this data. 
There is education data for some of the licensing. As you can imagine, it, it hones in uh, primarily with accountancy and uh, medical professions, uh, some with uh, cosmetology and uh, real estate. And there is employment data. We were kind of surprised to find that there was actual employment data being listed, uh, but it's very sparse. And so not as helpful at this point, but then that's why we're integrating it into our workforce uh, system. Next slide. A few other surprises are that this, um, the state of Indiana has done a really good job of keeping and also digitizing uh, license information all the way back to the late 1800s. Most of those were for registered nurses, not doctors, mind you, but registered nurses. Um, we thought because of the combined database and the work that had gone into uh, capturing all of this information in a, a digital way, that there might have been a, a deeper level of documentation and definitions available. That has proven uh, tougher to come by, and we had to revert to actually capturing in one place uh, all of the actual application forms. And I'm sure many of you know how that goes. Sometimes you have to revert back to the actual document used to collect the information uh, to drive the, the metadata that you need to understand what is this actually telling us. Uh, and even though the database is consolidated, the actual boards and the forms and the work that they do in terms of policy are not integrated, but rather uh, served by the public licensing agency as an umbrella organization. Next slide. So what happened to us once we got this information, uh, transformed it in ways that it was usable? Uh, it was interesting to us, and this is where I do sound a little data geeky, but we, we matched almost half of the entire one and a half million record file uh, to wage records that we have going back to the 1990s. Uh, and we had a, an approximately 80% match rate for records dated uh, 2004. And so we were really pleased with uh, the overall results of this. Uh, we hope to delineate recommendations for the licensing folks. Uh, who collect that data uh, on ways that we might be able to uh, improve that match. Uh, we really would like to see an improvement in the date of birth uh, for matching purposes. If you don't have a complete social security number, uh, full name with middle name and date of birth uh, are really critical to this. And so not having a date of birth and only the four digits of the social uh, were something of an impediment. Next slide. So what we've done is, is we've created a, a dynamic database. And I, I call it that because even though currently we're, we're pulling it automatically on a monthly basis, we do plan to, to shift that to a weekly uh, basis in the future. Because in certain professions, there's really a lot of activity going on. And it'd be nice to uh, tap into a bit of that real-time activity that we can get through this database. Uh, we, we successfully linked the data and uh, yielded results in terms of, of NAICS and uh, average wages over time. And I'm sure you can all guess, uh, since we can include so many health professionals in this database, uh, the folks that, that made the highest uh, average annual wage. Next slide. So uh, we have active professionals now, uh, and we've, we've set this up by year and by type of license, the type of uh, license and wage uh, that's being garnered. Uh, there weren't any real surprises to us in the wage data, uh, but what it does enable us to do is to affirm 
for our states and localities what the average earnings are for folks who are interested in entering uh, fields that require a license and tie it more closely to the places in our state that provide education that can lead to those licenses. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that, that Michelle used in the report and also uh, in one of the top level slides today are some very important definitions uh, that were put out in the Census Bureau's uh, first ever report on alternative education credits. And it's been very critical for us in explaining to our policymakers what it is we know from this professional licensing database and that it is not the kind of certificate that one gets when they take a, a say a Microsoft uh, course in SQL Server or .NET or Office 2013. Uh, that is not the kind of certification credential that we're collecting with this information. Next slide. Uh, license a, a license definition, even though generically everybody calls these licenses uh, in terms of even the name of the agency that collects the information, a lot of them are really more like a permit uh, that, that uh, allows you to do something in a particular state. And the whole idea behind it was, was consumer protection. Um, if you see that license up on the wall in the barber shop or at the stylist, uh, you know uh, that that person went through certain hoops uh, in order to be qualified. Next slide. And in terms of a certificate, and, and these are, our agency in Indiana is not uh, delineating these as, as carefully as the Census Bureau does. Uh, but for our purposes, we're using the Census Bureau definitions, and we are trying not to uh, mess up the terminology, if you will. So I've just uh, gone through in my slides to talk with you all about how did we do it? Uh, what were some of the nuts and bolts things that, that we did with this? How did we get it constructed? And gave you a little taste of what we'll do with it. But my colleagues who will follow me are going to give you a much more real life example of what they've learned from their work. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome, and thank you, Carol. Um, next, we're going to hand over the presentation to Catherine Imperator. Hello. Thank you very much for having me today, Michelle. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, a bit of a higher level view of our project, the Certification Data Exchange Project. So if we could move on to the next slide. So the overarching goal of this project is, um, as with many of the projects that you hear today, is to facilitate the exchange of data between education and workforce systems and the industry certifying organizations so that we can eventually know what certifications are awarded, who is getting them, and the value they have. And this project's ultimate goal is to facilitate that through a national clearinghouse for this kind of data exchange. Um, where we are, step one of raising awareness and gaining consensus has, I believe, been ongoing for the past couple of years and will continue as more people, more stakeholders in education and workforce development become interested in and see the importance of this issue. We're currently also working in step two, and that's primarily what I'm going to focus on today. Um, later on, I'll also describe the players in this project and how the certification data exchange project got started. So if we'll move on to talk a little bit about the pilot participants, step two, the pilot studies uh, aim to exchange data between an industry certifier and a state longitudinal data system in order to report on the characteristics and the outcomes of test takers and those who pass the exam. Uh, up to this point, we've been working with community college systems, um, but ideally, eventually, the project will expand to include secondary systems as well. The first um, pilot study took place between Illinois and CompTIA, the um, IT certifier. And after that was very successful, the project was expanded to be working with the other states that you see displayed. OK, and next slide. 
So the Illinois project took place in 2012. And uh, before I forget, many thanks to the Illinois Community College Board who provided um, a lot of this information. The data matching protocol in Illinois, uh, what they received from CompTIA is a, the first name, the last name, and the zip code. CompTIA provided that individual student level data with those three elements from their test takers in 2005 through 2010. And the ICCB matched that to their four credit students. Uh, ideally, another expansion that we'd like to see in the future is including uh, non-credit students as well in future stages of the project. So, and we'll move on to talk, talk a little more about the process. The data sharing agreement uh, that was signed between Illinois and CompTIA was an indemnification agreement, an indemnified CompTIA which protects CompTIA in case the data should be improperly shared. Remember again, CompTIA is the one in this situation providing the individual level data. The reporting back from the state uh, would be an aggregate form. Uh, ICCB also uh, supplemented this with variables uh, related to employment and earnings. Um, that employment data was from their Center for Governmental Studies at Northern Illinois University, and that's the data agent for the Illinois Department of Employment Security. So as you can see, uh, Illinois and CompTIA, they had a very successful match, 78% match achieved. Uh, and the outcomes were quite positive for certified students with higher employment and earnings over time. So that was something great to see. Illinois produced a lot more data, but unfortunately I don't have time to share it all. So the next step, following the success of the Illinois CompTIA project, was really when we formed the Certification Data Exchange Project and the broader advisory group. Uh, major participants in the project include my organization, which is ACTE, uh, as well as the Department of Education. Of course, CompTIA, the Manufacturing Institute, has been very interested. Um, Bob Sheets from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has been a major resource. And there are many more interested parties who form part of the broader advisory group. Uh, that was when the roadmap was created that I displayed earlier. And we also decided to expand on the Illinois case by uh, recruiting more states to try out what Illinois had, had tried. So, uh, and this is just the roadmap again that you saw before that's now created and we'll move on and look at a little bit more about the pilot tasks and deliverables in the next slide. So this is just a little more detail on what each of the pilot states is um, signing on to when they sign on to participate in the project. As you can see, this includes executing a data sharing agreement, and I'll talk a little bit more on that later, uh, developing a data matching protocol and conducting the match, and outputting tables based on key demographics, age, gender, race, ethnicity, as well as zip codes. Uh, addition, additionally, special populations, if available, and finally, the uh, employment and earnings information. So one of the interesting things that we learned when we expanded this project um, was that some states are telling us that they simply cannot sign indemnification agreements. Um, this was a hurdle that was able to be cleared with Illinois and California, but other states have been sort of stymied by this legal situation when it comes to, and it's a very important and foundational piece um, to the project. In addition, there is another paragraph in that indemnification agreement. It states that the agreement is governed by and in accordance with the laws of Illinois, which is where CompTIA is based. Now, that was fine when the project was in Illinois, um, but for other states, that also has been a bit of a stumbling block. Now we do, we have been working on ways to overcome these obstacles and we have some very promising ideas and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the California case. So since they were able to sign the indemnification agreement, they were able to go ahead and do the match. Like Illinois, they also got first name, last name, and zip code from CompTIA. And they're working to match that and, and also use their larger set of variables in their databases. Um, They've been using records from 2006 through 2011. And the process that they've been using is very briefly outlined up on your screen. It does involve using two California databases, their um, community college CCC apply, as well as their chancellor's office management information system. So, and we'll move on to talk a little bit about their results. Now, their first go round on the match hasn't gone so well. Um, they have experienced some difficulties. Um, making the match. One of the problems they've experienced is with zip codes that don't seem to make sense for the subject of the certification. 
so for instance, people majoring in early childhood education who are taking a computer certification. Now that's certainly perfectly possible, but it did raise some questions uh, to the data team about whether that was the proper match. Also, um, in some instances, there's some discrepancies whether the zip code used was the test taker's residence or the exam location where they were taking the test at the time. Uh, they've also ha come across some records with questionable ages, um, people who seem to be 11 years old who were taking the test. And then, of course, there's the perennial issue, especially in a large state, of people who simply have the same name. So they will be working again to try and improve that match with some guidance from the Illinois folks. And we do certainly expect that that number will get higher given the 78% match that Illinois achieved. So to address some of the challenges that we uh, have faced, we do have some ideas going forward. CompTIA is exploring changing the language um, that test takers um, see to opt in to share their information, which could impact the continued need for that indemnification agreement um, rather than a, a different sort of data sharing agreement. They're going to, they're still kind of ironing this out. They're going to make an announcement in a couple of weeks. So I don't want to steal their thunder, um, but I will definitely share that information with WDQC and they can share that out at that time. They are also looking, uh, CompTIA is also looking to increase the amount of information collected at test registration to improve the data match while not being overly burdensome or intrusive. So as you can see on the screen, Illinois and California have each shared the list of variables they think would be ideal. Um, and we also have ideas for, ideas for some elements that would be minimally intrusive uh, to add to the collection. And finally, we're just working to expand the project by recruiting more certifying bodies into, into the project. So we have high hopes of getting around the legal hurdles soon and moving forward with the pilot project based on the successful Illinois example. There's a lot to do, but we think that we have a good proof of concept to build on. And uh, feel free to visit the website for more information and or contact me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was great information. And um, at this time, we're going to hand over the presentation to Matthew Meyer. Matthew, it's all yours. Thanks, Jen. L let me know if you have a problem hearing me. This phone uh, I'm talking on is older than me, so um, hopefully it'll work all right. Real quick, uh, also, in listening to the other two speakers, I'll just tell you up front, our project is a baby compared to theirs. I, I, we don't have any results yet, um, but we are a movement, a, uh, a, really a consortium of nearly 70% of all the community colleges in the country. Uh, we came together because a lot of us have similar issues that we are working through. Um, you know, with the release of Round 4 TAC grant, uh, at least colleges in North Carolina have been struggling to be able to provide the data that DOL is looking for. And a lot of times it's because uh, they can't be case managers to track down our students who typically have to self-report whether or not they've received a third-party certification. Um, and so back in December, I was having this problem scratching my head, and I happened to get a call from the California Community College System, a, a data person there, and we began talking. and thought it might be uh, kind of a sort of an interesting uh, effort to see if other colleges were in the same place. We somehow enabled uh, to have a huge conference call where we got all these colleges and we all had common issues uh, going forward relative to data with third party credentialing groups. And so we began to take it a little bit further. Um, go ahead to the next slide there. You can kind of see this is actually from the report um, that, that Michelle was talking about. And you can see where we've got representation. It's not only community colleges that are involved with this. We have uh, advocacy groups. We've got um, boards of education, uh, higher education involved with us. We've got uh, the National Network for Business and Industry Associations working with us. So. Uh, we're excited about what we're doing, even though it's a fairly, well, it's not simple, but it's a fairly simple thing that we are initially looking at, and that is whether or not one of our community college students attains a third-party credential, if we are able to be able to make the match, be able to identify that without that student having to do a self-report or staff at our colleges having to 
make those calls to try to track down a student is essentially what we're looking for. We got together, next slide, we got together face-to-face -face April 7th um, it was during the uh, American Association for Community Colleges, their conference in D.C., and I was able to organize a meeting where we brought in the groups that are listed on the slide as well as a bunch of community college uh, presidents and, and key staff, and we talked about this. And, and the great outcome in my mind is we had went around the table and discussed where we really take this group next is that we are now looking at a pilot project with the National Student Clearinghouse um, and working with, again, the National Network for Business and Industry Associations. Uh, we're actually reconvening next week to talk about, um, and possibly with the National Institute of Metalworking, about how to conduct this pilot where uh, we want to take a college, for, for example, uh, I'm sitting here at Forsyth Technical Community College in Winston-Salem to be able to, to use their data. They're, they're, they're deep into working with their students and third-party credentials in manufacturing and be able to have them ping the, the national student clearinghouse to see if they can make the match to their students, see if they can learn which students actually passed the NIMS exam, for example. Um, you can hit the next slide. I think I kind of talk about that here. Yeah, so th this is what we're looking to do. We want to identify the cost for the credentialing bodies, those associations. We want to try to identify what type of other issues such as security and how to handle FERPA and even some of the, the legal issues as well. Uh, we, just like what Catherine was talking about, we're modeling this after the CompTIA project for the most part. Uh, and and we're, we've learned a lot from that, uh, again, because I'm working with the California Community College system and folks who are involved, as well as with um, the Florida system. Uh, an individual down in the Florida system was involved in Illinois, and he's on our group. And so we, we've got a lot of resources that we're working with through our community colleges. Uh, and again, our hope is, you know, real low-hanging fruit. You know, did the student pass the exam? And if, once we get to that point, we'll start looking at other opportunities um, for the, the, this group that we're calling the Workforce Credentialing Coalition. And there's how you can get involved if you're a community college person out there. Feel free to email me or uh, Rena over in California, either one of us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. And I would like to thank all of our panelists today. Um, the webinar is not over yet. And before we hand it, op or hand it over for general questions from the audience, I would like to propose one question for all of the panelists. And that is, what are the sources of funding that were involved in carrying out these projects? So um, Matt, Catherine, Carol. Um, I, I can go real quick. Um, we have no funding. And if you want to give, right there's my email, or was, uh, feel free. But we, we're, we're doing this on a shoestring. Uh, I'm going to have to join with Matt and say that we, too, were doing it on a shoestring. But because of all the work that had come before and had been funded by grants from Lumina and Lilly Endowment, as well as our own university funds, uh, we were able to handle this uh, pretty easily, frankly. And uh, this is Catherine. Yes, there there is also a, currently no funding for the um, the certification data exchange project either. Okay. Well, thank you for <laughs> for addressing that. I appreciate it. And at this time, I'm going to hand the presentation back over to Josh so that he can go through um, the the steps for questions from the audience. Thank you. Great. So if you have a question for any of our panelists, please click on the hand raising button located on the left side of your control panel. Um, when you do that, um, I'll meet your line so you can uh, ask a question or you can always type in your question in the question box on the control panel. And there was a couple questions that came in um, uh, while folks were speaking. And uh, these two questions actually um, are related to the CompTIA project. One, um, the first one is, are HVAC credentials and certifications included in this project? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that specific level of detail. Okay. 
Hey, real quick, um, those are some of the certifications that we have interest in. We sent out a survey to all the community colleges involved with us, and um, some of the HVAC. Uh, in fact, there was about a, a list of about 60 uh, national certifications that the colleges sent back that they want us to begin to attack. So uh, I would say uh, a definite on that. And the other question is, who at the state level signs the indemnification agreement in the CompTIA ACTE project? Related to that, what is the role of a state Department of Labor in collecting or providing workforce or certificate data in partnering in these state pilot projects? Um, okay, first part again, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the first part is, um, uh, who at the state level signs the indemnification agreement in the project? Uh, let me see if I, I don't have an answer to that. I do know that it's something that can go up to the highest levels, at least in conversation, since we haven't had too many successful um, signatories at this point. Um, but it is definitely something that your state's attorney general, you know, might actually be involved in discussing with you. Um, but as far as who signs, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Uh, and the other question, uh, what is the role of the State Department of Labor in collecting or providing workforce or certificate data in partnering in these state pilot projects? Um, well, definitely in Illinois, um, there was some partnership. The um, Community College Board was sort of the primary on it, and then they worked with the um, Department of Employment Security to pull in that labor information. And um, California has not, um, they're just working right now on the first part of the match with the community college. So at least in our case so far, the community college system has been sort of the primary and then it's going to, say, a Department of Labor or something similar to um, pull that employment information. And I did, to go back to the previous question, I did just pull up a little more information on Illinois and um, which certifications from CompTIA were included. And so just to, to share that, it was the A+, Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus, Project+, Plus, and there were um, 14 of miscellaneous certifications. So th those are the, um, the IT certifications that were included, at least in the CompTIA Illinois um, project. All right, we have a question from Brad Turner. Uh, little, and I open up your line. You can go ahead and ask your question. Great, thank you. This is Brad Turner Little. I'm with Goodwill Industries International, um, Director of Mission Strategy here. Thank you so much for the uh, the great content that's been presented so far today. Uh, a couple quick things, and, and Michael, I've already sent you an email um, asking for some specific follow-up um, on the, the work that you're doing. Uh, my question, really, and it may relate a, a bit to the first two parts of the presentations today, uh, we at Goodwill are thinking a lot about um, not just helping people, um, you know, complete credentials uh, that are valued in a local labor market, um, and working with community college partners and other credentialing entities to help that happen. Uh, but we're, we're looking at ways to really capture data um, for those folks that enter into training-related employment um, and how we can get that. And I was interested if, um, in the first two parts of the presentation, um, if they, it, you know, I saw there was you know, reporting against employment and wage records and those sorts of things and the ability to sort of dig into that. Um, I wondered if there was another layer underneath that that was really looking at were folks getting employment or maybe moving up into training-related uh, uh, employment opportunities, or whether that that data at this point was just sort of general employment data that that yes, you know, John Doe is was working. Um, is there another layer underneath that that says yes, John Doe is working and he's actually working in the field that he received his credential in? Thank you. That's actually, this is Carol Rogers from Indiana. Uh, that is actually something that we're moving into with our next uh, phase of integration with the career and technical education programs that occur in our high schools and through dual credit, as well as any uh, ETA, Employment and Training Administration funded training programs for which we have records as well. And so the short answer is yes, that can definitely be a layer. 
And what's exciting about it is doing exactly what you said, tracking their progress uh, through their career and to see how aligned their training is to what they're actually uh, doing on the job. Yes, I definitely agree. That is the kind of information that we in our project and probably any project that's looking in this wants to get to. Uh, I think that probably is a few steps down the road. Um, my understanding is that um, that is a, a difficult layer to follow people through um, what they studied in their education or training and then into finding out if they're actually employed in that field. Um, but that is certainly something that we look forward to, to adding and incorporating as we, as we move forward. And yeah, this is um, Rachel, the director of the Workforce Data Quality Campaign. I just wanted to chime in on that because um, we have gotten this question a lot. And, of, and Brad, as you probably know, but just to clarify for folks in the audience who um, may not be as familiar with the issue, I think what you're really asking about is when you make it a match with UI wage records, you can tell the industry but not the occupation. Is that I think that's the issue. And so the industry can be somewhat misleading sometimes about whether this is someone who's really in training related employment. So there has been some movement by states to start thinking about uh, adding occupation to the UI wage records. Um, and I'd encourage you to look at the WDQC website. We do have some information from some other groups that are doing research on that and surveying states. Um, and we're going to be sort of following state efforts to think about adding that information and kind of do a cost-benefit analysis about what that would take to get. All right. Um, if there's other questions, feel free to uh, click on the hand raising button on the control panel, and I'll open up your line. There's a, a question that was typed in uh, by Evelyn Thompson, um, Thompson uh, to any of the panelists. Do the certifications you are referring to in lieu of degrees or in addition to? It's both. Uh, sometimes uh, people are getting a license or a certificate to have a permit to do things. Uh, for example, pesticide application. People have to get permits. And those data are actually uh, collected. So we have a lot of data on employee permits that don't require any education. But then we also have doctors, accountants, and engineers where part of their license uh, does require uh, specific uh, formal education. Yes, I would agree that it was both. Um, since our project so far has been working with CompTIA and those are IT-related certifications, um, it, either instance could, could play a factor either uh, in conjunction with some other credential or as a, as a credential in, in itself. Uh, and certainly as and the project to include other fields, um, that will be something to consider. All right. Um, we have another question from Roy Swift. Uh, have any certified individuals objected to their information shared or sent to a database and matched with other data? Could you repeat the question? <clears throat> yes. So, have any certified individuals objected to their information shared or sent to a database and matched with other data? Uh, not in Indiana. But the thing is, their data are utilized under severely protected handling. And so the only information that is ever made uh, public in any fashion is always aggregated data. And we have state laws now that are permitting the matching of, of these records. Yeah, and I second what Carol said. All right. Uh, so there's another question um, from Sharon DeMario. Uh, is the data encouraging consolidation of certification and credentialing organizations across the country or at a minimum within a region?
Anyone? Repeat that I question. apologize, but I guess I didn't quite understand the question. So the question was, is the data encouraging consolidation of certification and credentialing organizations across the country or at a minimum within a region? Encouraging uh, doing multi-state sharing or encouraging something else? I get, we probably would need to get some clarification from that per, from that person. Yeah, and I, I think I think just looking at it, I don't think any of our projects would be encouraging the consolidation of various third-party certifications. Now, um, I mean, I, I personally think there are certifications out there that are of great value, and there are certifications out there that uh, are not of much value, uh, but that. For at least talking about our focus with the community colleges, that we'll, we'll leave that up to Roy and his group to really work on how we can identify uh, credentials that have value and meaning. All right. Well, there. Um, I just let's see. Um, there isn't any other questions that are coming in right now. Um, so you can turn it back over to Michelle. All right. Thank you very much, Josh, and thank you to all of our participants today. After the webinar, um, everyone who is registered will receive a short survey and a link to information about um, the availability of the webinar recording. So if there are any other follow-up questions that the audience may think of after the webinar ends, then feel free to contact the Workforce Data Quality Campaign, and we will try to vet your questions to the appropriate panelists um, or find an answer for you. So even if you can't think of anything right now and if something jumps up and um, you think about it later, you always have a way to reach back and contact us, and we'll make sure that we address your question, comment, or concern. Um, so that's all for us today, and again, I would like to thank all of our webinar participants as well as the panelists who participated today, Carol Rogers, Catherine Imperator, and Matthew Meyer. Thank you very much. Thank you.